Hello, my name is Eliyahu Unger Sargon, and in this video, I'd like to take a look at a text from the early rabbinic period that sings the praises of circumcision. This is quite a famous text that religious advocates of Jewish circumcision will often cite as proof of how important circumcision is to the Jewish religion. If, like me, you find circumcision to be an ethically problematic rite, this text will probably make you uncomfortable. It certainly made me uncomfortable when I first came across it. But I actually think that some of the most exciting and productive forms of Jewish study emerge from confrontations with the texts in the tradition that rub us the wrong way. And as I will demonstrate, there's a lot more to this particular text than meets the eye. Let's learn. Our first text comes from the Mishnah in Tractate Nadarim, which deals with the laws around vows and oaths and promises. The Mishnah states, If someone says, I vow not to benefit from those who are foreskinned, he is allowed to derive benefit from foreskinned Jews, but he may not derive benefit from the circumcised nations of the world. Conversely, if he says, I vow not to benefit from those who are circumcised, he is not allowed to derive benefit from foreskinned Jews, and he is allowed to derive benefit from the circumcised nations of the world. For the foreskin is only used to describe non-Jews. As it is written, for all the nations are uncircumcised, but all the house of Israel are uncircumcised of heart. And it says, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be. And it says, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. So the rabbis of the Mishnah here have conjured a thought experiment. Imagine I swear not to benefit from those who are intact, and an intact Jewish man agrees to fund my next film project. The Mishnah informs us that I can actually take the money and make my film, but I can't take money from a non-Jewish man who is circumcised. On the other hand, if I swear not to benefit from those who are circumcised and that same intact Jew offers to bankroll my film, I can't take the money, but I can take money from a circumcised non-Jew. In other words, my vow is understood to be using the terms circumcised and intact as euphemisms for Jews and non-Jews, rather than as descriptive terms of the anatomy of the person that I might benefit from. The Mishnah continues. Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah says, the foreskin is repulsive, as is evident from the fact that the wicked are disgraced through it. As it is written, for all the nations are foreskinned. Rabbi Shmuel says, so great is circumcision that 13 covenants were sealed with regard to it. Rabbi Yossi says, so great is circumcision that it overrides the strictures of the Sabbath. Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha says, Great is circumcision, as is evident from the fact that the punishment of Moses the righteous was not postponed for even an hour. Rabbi Nehemia says, So great is circumcision that it overrides the prohibitions around the tsara'at skin condition. Rabbi says, So great is circumcision that despite all the commandments that Abraham our patriarch performed, he was not called complete until he circumcised himself. As it is stated, walk before me and be perfect. Alternatively, so great is circumcision that if not for it, the Holy One, blessed be he, would not have created his world. As it is stated, thus says God, if my covenant be not with day or night, I would not have appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. So there's a lot going on here. We get a chorus of rabbinic voices supplying us with a variety of arguments and biblical references to demonstrate their assertion that circumcision is a special commandment. In typical rabbinic fashion, the literary structure here builds to a climax with the over-the-top statement that the existence of the world itself depends on the commandment of circumcision. A question leaps out at us from this text. Why are the rabbis being so hyperbolic about circumcision? The rabbis recognized hundreds of religious commandments, so why are they putting so much emphasis on this one? At this point, an advocate of religious circumcision might say that the answer to this question is simple. The rabbis sincerely believed that circumcision is this important. Case closed. 
And I don't want to just dismiss this perspective. The rabbis clearly thought of circumcision as very important, and it would be dishonest for anyone to suggest otherwise. But there's something positively peculiar about this text. The overwhelming majority of Mishnah, 95% of it, is devoted to dry ritual law. A further 3.4% of the text is devoted to religious memory, a lot of which is descriptions of how things were done in the temple in Jerusalem. Another 2.9% consists of stories, most of which are brought for the specific purpose of supporting or illustrating a ritual law. The remaining 1.7% of Mishnahs fall into the category of Agadah, which is a more free-flowing genre of rabbinic literature that often relies heavily on biblical reference. And broadly speaking, our text falls into this general Agadah category. But I think that our text in Adarim is part of an even rarer subcategory of Mishnaic Agadah. It's a category of Mishnah that I have come to call the thematic rabbinic aside. This sort of Mishnah is vanishingly rare, but striking in the seven instances that it makes an appearance. So what's going on here? What were the rabbis up to in this rare aside in Nadarm? One possible explanation is that they were availing themselves of an opportunity to polemicize against the competing Jewish sect of early Christians. Here's what Paul had to say about circumcision in Romans. For he is not a real Jew who is one outwardly, nor is true circumcision something external and physical. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart, spiritual, not literal. The idea then would be that the extensive praise for circumcision in our Mishnah is a way of responding to Pauline Christianity, which de-emphasized and downplayed the importance of circumcision. The problem with this explanation is that while the rabbis of the Mishnah certainly had their fair share of axes to grind, it's unlikely that they would have considered the early Christians a threat worthy of this level of rhetoric. Remember that at this time, Christianity had not yet become the official religion of the Roman Empire, and the rabbis had bigger theological fish to fry. Another explanation given is that the rabbis here were virtue signaling around circumcision against the backdrop of mass Hellenization in Palestine. Ever since Alexander the Great conquered Judea in the 4th century BCE, Hebrew and Greco-Roman culture had been in competition for the hearts and minds of the average Judean. There's strong historical evidence that a plurality of Second Temple Jews objected to circumcision, many Judean men even going as far as restoring their foreskins, a practice that the rabbis despised. In this reading, favored by the scholar Shia Cohen, the rabbis here were signaling to their Hellenized brothers that they were out of step with the dictates of the tradition. This explanation has the advantage of making more historical sense, but we're still left with the mystery of the intensity of the passage. Why the rare aside, and why so over the top? To really understand this Mishnah, we need to turn to more recent scholarship. In her brilliant 2014 master's thesis, The Foreskin and the Foreskinned in Ancient Jewish Literature, Yedida Koren argues that part of the revolution of rabbinic Judaism was a sharp departure from previous concepts of the Jewish body. In the centuries following Alexander's conquest, the circumcised penis came to be associated with the Jewish body, and the intact penis, along with its imitator, the restored penis, came to be associated with the Greek body. And it was these strong body associations that set the stage for the invention of conversion through adult circumcision by John Hyrcanus, as we saw in a previous study. But if you look at some of the pre-Rabbinic sacred texts from the Second Temple period, you can get a sense of the place that infant circumcision held in religious Judean culture. And everyone that is born, the flesh of whose foreskin is not circumcised on the eighth day, belongs not to the children of the covenant which God made with Abraham, but to the children of destruction. Nor is there, moreover, any sign on him that he is God's, but he is destined to be destroyed and slain from the earth and to be rooted out of the earth, for he has broken the covenant of our God. Matthew Thiessen and other scholars have argued that this text, which was working off of a different manuscript of the Abraham story from Genesis 17, shows us that it was circumcision on the eighth day specifically that achieved covenantal status in Second Temple religious communities. And this text in the Book of Jubilees gives us a sense of the fear that these Jews had for what might happen to their boys if for some reason they missed this covenantal eighth day window. 
Circumcision on the eighth day, it seems, was understood to be a way of saving Jewish boys from the dangers of divine wrath. But the rabbis weren't having any of it. An infant may be circumcised on the eighth or the ninth or the tenth or the eleventh or the twelfth day after birth, no earlier and no later. How so? In the ordinary manner, a child is circumcised on the eighth day. If he is born at dusk, he is circumcised on the ninth day. If he is born at dusk on Friday evening, he is circumcised on the tenth day. If a festival follows the Sabbath, he is circumcised on the eleventh day. If the two days of the Rosh Hashanah holiday should follow the Sabbath, he will be circumcised on the twelfth day. Should the infant be ill, we do not circumcise him until he recovers. Not only were the rabbis flexible around the timing of infant circumcision, which was a big departure from the other religious Jewish communities of the time, but their concern ran against the grain of their co-religionist sensibilities as well. They weren't concerned about the danger that might come to the infant from not circumcising him by the eighth day. They were concerned about the danger to the infant from the practice of circumcision itself. And if we come back to our Mishnah in Nidarim, with this context in mind, what pops out at us from the first part of the Mishnah is the phrase foreskinned Jew. This phrase would have sounded very much like an oxymoron to anyone who heard it at the time it was written. The Jews were the circumcised and the Greeks were the uncircumcised. A foreskinned Jew would have been an obvious contradiction in terms. But the rabbis invented this new category of Jewish body, and the thought experiment in Nidarim is one of the first places that it appears. Koren argues against Cohen and many other scholars that this is the reason that we have our famous section of hyperbolic praise for circumcision here. The rabbis knew how radical the idea of a foreskinned Jew was. They knew how it would have sounded to anyone outside of their small circle of scholars. And to preempt any negative reactions, they appended both an expression of disgust for the foreskin and over-the-top praise for circumcision to their introduction of the foreskinned Jew. I find Koren's reading here to be both elegant and efficient. It answers our question of why the rabbis are being so hyperbolic about this one commandment. They know that it might sound to some people like they're undermining circumcision. It answers the question of what the rabbis were up to. They just blew our minds with this new category of the foreskin Jew, so they needed to place something immediately after to help readers absorb the impact. Remember when I mentioned that there are seven instances in the Mishnah of thematic rabbinic asides? Well, if you compare them, five out of the seven come in parts of the Mishnah where the rabbis have just introduced some of their most radical ideas. And while not every instance fits the bill, I think this pattern lends support to Koren's idea. If Yedida Koren's reading is correct, the irony here is striking. This passage of praise that is so often quoted by religious proponents of circumcision as proof of the rite's importance is actually a rabbinic smokescreen for a radical reinvention of the Jewish body that made room for intact Jews. A reinvention which, as we showed in a previous text study, would set the stage for later luminaries in the Jewish tradition to articulate an open and welcoming religious approach more broadly to Jews who aren't circumcised. If you like what you've seen here, please support our work at Bruchim, where we advocate for an open and welcoming reception of Jews who think differently about circumcision and their children. Thank you for your attention.